Uh, so, thank you, Parliamentary Secretary. Now, my late friend Rex Nettleford used to say, flattery will get you everywhere. I thank you. So, good afternoon to all of you, and happy to see all of you, and welcome to this event. And um, to quote my other late friend, Sidney Poitier, when he received his Oscar, he said, it's been a long journey to this time. And it has been. And uh, Al Dillett, when he was speaking earlier today, mentioned the personal connection between myself and himself. And if you permit me, I'd just, Prime Minister, like to go down that personal journey. Because when I woke up in Toronto this morning, I thought, when was the last time I was here for some kind of official event? And then I went and looked back at this memoir that I had written shortly after the death of Lyndon Pindling in 2000. And it was at a turning point in my political life. And uh, the former Prime Minister, uh, Hubert Ingram, uh, was about to call a general election. And the question was, where I was then situated, what would I do? We had an arrangement that in exchange for certain actions on my part, there would be a certain response on their part. But as we in inched closer to the general election, it was clear that wasn't going to take place. And Lyndon Pindling had been in touch with me a couple of weeks before that to say, it's time to come back home. So I flew up here to Toronto, and CIBC was then having a reception for uh, the former prime minister. He was here on a business visit, and at the meeting, in front of everybody else, he made it clear that I was at a dead end. Bill Allen, the then finance minister, came over to me and said, well, I guess that's it, eh, Fred? So I said, well, yeah, I guess that's it. But, you know, they say in the, in the movie, uh, The Sound of Music, when the good Lord closes one door, he always opens another. So said, I returned home, and of course, now you see where I am. And it causes me, we were all together, all of us sitting at the Carifta Games in Nassau uh, during the last week. And uh, in the protocol list, you know, what am I, number three or something like this, and former prime ministers come after the whole cabinet. And uh, I didn't want to quite say, ain't God a good God, but I'll say it anyhow. <laughs> so I just thought I'd mention that. And I say that to the younger politicians here, and those of you who are interested in public service, that in the impatience in our present electorate for things to happen instantly, that things often take a long time. And if there is a mission that you have, you have to be serious and assiduous in that mission and unidirected in getting it done. And that is why I'm so pleased that we are now at this point where we have a Council General in Toronto. Many people have talked about this, but this Prime Minister, Philip Brave Davis, has gotten the job done. And I want to say thank you and congratulations. In my chat with the leader of the Bahamian group, she indicated that there are some 8,000 Bahamians who live in Canada from east to west. Many of them, as our High Commissioner said, are gathered in and around Toronto. And so it only makes sense for the Council General's office to be here with its primary responsibility to be reaching out to the diaspora. But there are other aggregations in Halifax in particular where people went to school at St. Mary's and Dalhousie and Arcadia. And then there's an aggregation in Prince Edward Island, uh, which is far out to the east. And of course, there are Bahamians who live in Vancouver. We're not a country that can afford to cover all of those places, but we are in fact appointing, in the process of appointing an honorary council for Halifax to serve the needs of Bahamians in that area. But we are pledged by this office 
by the office in, of the High Commissioner in Ottawa to serve the interests of Bahamians. And people worry about Bahamians leaving the Bahamas and emigrating to other countries. I don't see that as a negative because wherever Bahamians go, they carry the Bahamas with them and they reach back to their home country. They are the ambassadors of the country, and I, I thank all of them for reaching back and always thinking of us, and we will do our best to ensure that we have a country which is well governed with a good reputation so that when you raise that passport at the border, you are proud to do so. The leader of the opposition and his colleagues have a forensic enthusiasm for costs. Last week we were in the House of Assembly and we were being examined forensically on how much did this cost and who is appointed where and how many people are where and what are they doing and all the rest of it. A U.S. diplomat came to see me in one of my iterations as Minister of Foreign Affairs. And uh, as it happens, when the U.S. diplomats show up, it's always something. So I... Uh, sat down and I gave this heavy sigh, I said, uh, Ambassador, what is it again today? And he said, well, the Bahamas wanted to be independent, so don't complain, this comes with it. So I say to those who have this forensic enthusiasm about costs, that it costs to do this. And if we want to be in the game, we have to be prepared to pay the price. And we are paying the price we're not being profligate. We're being judicious in the way we apply our funds. And we know that we have to be accountable to our citizens at home and to Parliament. And this Prime Minister is committed to that. Our vision is that Bahamians will be able to travel seamlessly around the world so that when they see that Bahamian passport, they say, without let or hindrance, pass by. And we will continue to work on that as long as it is our responsibility to carry out the job of governing the Commonwealth of the Bahamas on behalf of the Bahamian people. And so thank you for, for all of you who do the work, who caused this to be possible. The names have already been mentioned, and I simply have to say I agree. I also want to thank all Bahamians again who live overseas and our international partners for their support. In particular, I want to mention the CARICOM partners who are here because <laughs> another aspect of our foreign policy is that we are committed to functional cooperation with our CARICOM neighbors. And this Prime Minister does nothing without checking with his colleagues in the region before a decision is made about what our foreign policy decisions are. And then to the Government of Canada for permitting this office to be opened and for all the support which Canada gives us, both uh, in material support, financial support, uh, business investment, tourism. It is a wonderful relationship. Uh, your Prime Minister Justin came to the Bahamas as a little boy with his father, Pierre. They had a friendship with uh, Dick Birch, who owns, uh, the small, owned the Small Hope Bay Lodge, now owned by Jeff Birch, and he and Jeff are friends to this day. So he knows the Bahamas well. And that is emblematic of the kind of relationship which Canada has with the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. And of course, we share membership in the Commonwealth. Thank you, too, to the people of tourism. They, too, are our advanced soldiers overseas. And you do a great job in attracting people to our country. And I'm pleased that the Parliamentary Secretary was able to be here to represent the minister. So you know a bit about our vision, a bit about my personal journey. And now it's my honor and privilege, having said all those things. Uh, you can forget everything that I said, because the person who's really going to speak is going to say what's really important. He's our Prime Minister, led us to a magnificent victory in 2021 against many odds, and please stand and welcome him to give his remarks.